Next, we have uh, Dr. Lauren Council. Dr. Council is an associate professor of dermatology and associate director of the Center for Dermatology and Cosmetic Surgery, Dermatologic and Cosmetic Surgery, the Division of Dermatology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. She'll be speaking to us this evening regarding the use of telemedicine, kind of where we're at right now with telemedicine and uh, the, the different vehicles that we have to use such. So, Dr. Council, please take it away, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so at the onset of the pandemic, Medicare began to reimburse video telehealth visits at the same rate as in-person visits. And this certainly helps to encourage both physicians and patients to utilize this as a means of maintaining social distancing and avoiding keeping patients who are somewhat healthy um, out of the office and therefore out of uh, becoming in contact with someone who may not know that they carry the virus. There are several free platforms available to do this. Doximity is one, Zoom is one that many people use, and some of the electronic health records also have some of these platforms built in. Um, HIPAA compliance is another feature that's being waived right now as long as physicians are making reasonable um, efforts to maintain uh, patient privacy and are acting in good faith. Some copays are also waived if, if it's thought that the payment of a copay would prohibit a um, patient from seeing their physician, those can sometimes be waived, and this is true for Medicare. And a lot of the licensing requirements are also being waived. So historically, both the patient um, and the physician would either have to be in the same state or the physician would also have to have a license in the other state where the patient is located, and some of those are being loosened a little bit right now. There are three main types of telehealth visits, virtual visits um, or two-way audio video platforms. And those are the ones that are being used by most of the physicians in the United States. And these are the ones that are billed exactly the same way as office bills, visits using codes 99201 and 99215. Um, there's also store and forward and many dermatologists are using these. And this is where a patient might take a photograph of a suspicious lesion and then email it to the uh, physician who will then review it and then contact the patient with a treatment plan. And these use codes G2010. And finally, there's check-ins, which are two-way phone communications to determine the need for an in-person visit that uses the same billing code G2012. Policies vary depending on private for private payers, but again, Medicare is reimbursing now at higher rates. And there are some unique codes for telephone or email only visits as well. There are a few Council, things that are important. Uh, what, uh, what are you using in your practice right now? Our division is using mainly Doximity and Zoom to do um, the two-way video telehealth medicines. We're also just using directly, we use Epic as our electronic health record, and we're also having patients use the MyChart feature of Epic to send in photographs and then be contacted by the phone. That works a little bit better for some of our elderly patients who can sometimes have a family member take a picture and send it in, but it might be a little bit harder to convince an 85-year-old to download a, a certain app and, and do all the requirements to do a video telehealth visit. Sure, sure, great. And there are a few um, important things that you have to keep in mind as far as documentation of a telemedicine visit in order um, for it to be billed correctly. The first is the consent to treat and bill. So the patients have to be aware that you are billing their insurance and um, they actually might have a co-payment. They have to understand that it could actually be the same as if they were seeing you in person. You have to document who's present for the telehealth visit. If it's a minor, um, you have to document where the parents there, was it just the patient, what, what, who exactly was present. The location of both the patient and the physician, again, it, it matters whether they're in the same state or not and whether HIPAA was you were using a HIPAA compliant platform or whether the patient was comfortable signing a waiver of HIPAA um, compliance. I certainly would encourage anyone who's thinking of venturing into the realm of telemedicine to look at the AAD's telemedicine toolkit. It's available on the AAD website. They have a lot of information about coding platforms that can be used in different ways to optimize the telehealth visit. Um, CMS also has a lot of information as far as billing during the pandemic of Medicare patients um, and Dialogues in Dermatology, the audio uh, podcast of the um, American Academy of Dermatology has done a series of interviews about this topic as well. And then something that 
I'm a little bit more familiar with just because my practice is limited to most micrographic surgery and aesthetic care or how the pandemic is affecting the practice of these aspects of dermatology. It really depends on where you're located. There are states that have totally outlawed quote unquote elective procedures and there have very strict definitions of what elective can be. Um, some states say if it will result in permanent damage or uh, if it's life threatening and can result in death within eight weeks, then that surgery is emergent and those procedures are allowed. Um, some define elective to include some of the things that we do, but we may not consider totally elective, such as some of the skin cancer removals. So you really have to pay attention to your local regional guidelines first. Um, some of us are parts of larger academic or hospital centers, which also have a lot of layers of regulation and kind of define what our practice can entail at this specific moment. Many practices are having to make difficult decisions and prioritize based on tumor type and likelihood of metastasis and progression within the eight week defined period. So while most centers are still taking care of melanomas and squamous cell carcinomas, some patients are being asked to wait longer if they have a basal cell carcinoma to wait several weeks until things may be safer. And in certain cities like New York City, when things were really overwhelming the healthcare system, many practices completely shut down for a couple of weeks um, to accommodate for that. For the practices that have remained open and for these urgent cases in dermatology, it's really important that we all maintain good social distancing practices in the office. Um, there are different ways of doing this. You can have patients call when they arrive to the office and then come up right when they can be roomed as opposed to utilizing the waiting room. You can utilize a waiting room, but only have a few chairs out so that everyone in there would be six feet apart. Um, certainly reducing the overall volume of the office can help both fewer patients and fewer staff. And if you're seeing fewer patients, you need fewer staff as well. Um, everyone even everyone wears a mask. Visitors are minimized, really just the patients are coming in, not having their spouse or significant other coming in. Um, good hand washing techniques, personal protective equipment. So we're always making sure that if we're doing a procedure, we use goggles. Um, we actually are using N95 masks for procedures on the face, although our infectious disease colleagues have told us that's probably a little bit overkill. If you think that you could get any blood or fluid on your body, you should also be wearing a gown, hat, shoe covers, those sort of things. Um, and then we're really being aggressive about screening patients before they come into the visit. So asking questions about exposures to other individuals who have had the virus, fevers, coughs, loss of, loss of taste and smell, and those sort of sort of things. Right when a patient arrives, we're checking their temperatures, just trying to make sure that it's safe for them to be in the office. We put them right in a room. They stay there until the procedure's done, and then they are escorted out at the end of the day. And that's kind of a big change from how we normally do Mohs surgery, where there's a lot of turnover room to room, and we take care of a lot of patients. So we're significantly down in volume to be able to maintain this um, good social distancing. Oh, Lauren, that was one of my questions. So in this last month and a half, two months, You've not been down completely in your department. You've been doing surgery on some of these more significant tumors, those in areas of, of you know, great risk of metastasis, for instance. Well, it's, it's changed, and, and every week is something different. Um, initially, we really cut back and said, okay, if someone has an invasive melanoma or squamous cell carcinoma who we think is higher risk, we can take care of those patients, and that would be perineural invasion or a large tumor or an aggressive histological subtype. Um, once those patients had been cared for, uh, we then kind of expanded a little bit. Things in, I, I'm in the middle of the country, things have been pretty stable here, and our healthcare system has not been overwhelmed. So we've been able to take care of squamous cell carcinoma as well. But just to give you an example, we used to do surgeries five days a week. In the height of, of um, the pandemic here, we would we cut back to one day a week, and it was very, very few patients, only those who we really felt needed to come in. Now that things have sort of plateaued and things are doing okay, we've taken care of the melanoma and squamous cell carcinoma. We do have a plan in place in the next few coming weeks to take care of some of those patients with symptomatic or more aggressive basal cells, but it's at a, a greatly reduced volume. And again, we're still going to prioritize the patients with the more aggressive tumors first. So uh, Missouri has not yet gone to um, even non-essential. Today in Florida, we actually uh, had a, a little bit of a change uh, so that we can proceed with elective surgeries, but you're still to essential dermatology and those uh, very important cancers. Is that what's happening in Missouri? 
Well, it really depends on um, private practice. It's sort of loosely defined. So private practice um, has a little bit less regulations than some of the academic centers, and some of the academic centers are defining it differently. So beginning on Monday, May 4th, we are going to have some allowance of elective procedures to resume. Um, and these are some of the things that had been postponed eight weeks at the beginning of the pandemic. And what we call elective really are, are still essential. Like you mentioned, some of these are cancer operations and things like that. But starting next week, we're going to begin to do some of those again.